The Lord be with you on this seventh Sunday after Pentecost. I'm Ken Sherb from the district office. Delighted to be with you today for church and Bible class. I have no particular announcements to make here before the service begins, so let's begin with that opening hymn. <clears throat> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sin to God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, I am a poor miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them. 
and I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God to all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Glory be to God on high. God, your almighty power is made known chiefly in showing mercy. Grant us the fullness of your grace, 
that we may be called to repentance and made partakers of your heavenly treasures. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. first lesson is written in the Old Testament prophet Ezekiel, chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. He said to me, Son of man, stand on your feet and I will speak with you. And as he spoke to me, the Spirit entered into me and set me on my feet. And I heard him speaking to me, and he said to me, Son of man, I send you to the people of Israel, to nations of rebels who have rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day. The descendants also are impudent and stubborn. I send you to them, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God, and whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house, they will know that a prophet has been among them. This is the word of the Lord. Psalm 123. To you I lift up my eyes, O you who are enthroned in the heavens. Have mercy upon us, O Lord. Have mercy upon us, for we have had more than enough of contempt. Our soul has had more than enough of scorn of those who are at least, of the contempt of the proud. Glory to the Lord, and to our God, Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. The epistle is written in St. Paul's second letter to the church at Corinth, chapter 12, beginning at verse 1. I must go on boasting, though there is nothing to be gained by it. I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. On behalf of this man, I will boast. But on my own behalf, I will not boast, except of my weaknesses. Though, if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it, so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. So to keep me from being too elated by the past surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. <coughs> this is the word of the Lord. God. 
Gospel according to St. Mark, the sixth chapter. Jesus went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went among the villages teaching. And he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. And he said to them, Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you and will not listen to you, when you leave, shake the dust, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. This is the gospel of the Lord. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only God's Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten of not made, being of one substance to the Father, by the Yeah. 
peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The text is not any of the scripture lessons you just heard. Rather, it's a part of the scriptures, it's part of the service coming up. It's the second petition of the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come. Let us pray. These are your words, O God. Sanctify us in the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. It was one day while Jesus himself was in the act of praying that one of his disciples, we don't know which, came up to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray. And he did. But he did not immediately go into some theoretical discussion about prayer. He opened up his answer by saying, when you pray, say, and then he follows with what we have called pretty much ever since, the Lord's Prayer. And one of the things that he includes in that prayer is that second petition, thy kingdom come. He says, start with all the shoes on the right feet. Start in the right place. Start with God and call him who he is. Call him Father. And then very shortly after that, you add, thy kingdom come. And a bit after that, on earth as it is in heaven. So start in the right place. Start with God and what he says, not us and whatever we want to talk about, because as St. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but of power. Now, Luther, when he was explaining the Lord's Prayer and the large catechism, put in a little story. I think he made it up, but it's an interesting and I think useful story to make a point. He says, suppose there was a beggar who came to a great and mighty king. And the great and mighty king says, you ask beggar for anything you want. You name it, and I can give it to you, and I will. And the beggar contents himself just to ask for a bit of food, and not even fine, sumptuous food like the king would be accustomed to eating, but more the beggar's kind of food that he always ate himself. This guy would show himself to be really, really impudent. Why do you even come into the presence of the great king with such a paltry request? See, if the kingdom of God is about power, well, this beggar certainly didn't have a whole lot of respect for the king's power to grant him his wish. Either that or he just doesn't think the king will keep his word. And act in accord with his own promise. Jesus does not want us to think about our Heavenly Father in such terms. He doesn't want his people to be hesitant or tentative in praying. So he gives the very words and he says right up front toward the beginning of the prayer, you ask for a large petition. You ask for something that is sweeping. You ask Thy kingdom come. Pray for it to come on earth as it is in heaven. That is to you and to others around you. Now you know how the kingdom of God is talked about in the scriptures. Particularly in the gospels. When Jesus showed up on the scene, he started talking about it immediately. In fact, he said that when he showed up on the scene, the kingdom of God showed up on the scene. He said, the kingdom of God is at hand. He had come, not to condemn, but to save. He had come to dwell with us, the word made flesh in a kingdom of grace and truth that has no end. Now, of course, as time went by, people tried to turn that vision to suit their own ideas. People wanted to take Jesus and make him what might be called a bread king who would just fill their bellies or maybe heal an occasional disease. 
But there's much more to the kingdom of God than that. As St. Paul wrote to the Romans, the kingdom of God is not food and drink. It's righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. As Jesus himself said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these other things will be added to you. He knew that large things were at stake when he told people to pray, when he told you and me to pray. Thy kingdom come. Here's how intent Jesus himself was on seeking the kingdom. He taught those disciples when they asked him to pray. Yes, he did. But as he did so, he was on his way to Jerusalem. And he knew. He knew full well what was going to happen to him there. And you and I know in 2020 hindsight, we know it too. He would be acclaimed as king in Jerusalem. But it would be by mocking soldiers who put a purple robe on his back after they had worked him over. And they mashed down a crown, a crown of thorns, on his head. And at length they hung him on a cross that had the title above Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Here he is really recognized as king. And although everybody participating in all those recognitions may have meant it as a mockery, it was absolutely true. He was the king doing whatever he had to do in order to secure the kingdom, in order to seek and to save that which was lost. Prayer leads to action, or else it's hypocrisy. Our Lord was no hypocrite. He was putting not just his money where his mouth was, he was putting himself where his mouth was, and thereby making the payment beyond gold or silver or anything like that in this world to pay the price for your sins and mine. He did the sin-atoning, death-defying, life-creating work that the Father had given him to do. It was the work of bringing in the kingdom. Now the Holy Spirit has brought me and you into this kingdom when he called us by the gospel. And now here's a point that may raise our eyebrows. I can ask myself, how can I be indifferent to the spread of his kingdom when it obviously means so much to him? How can I be content with such poor, paltry prayers when he teaches me to pray the large prayer, thy kingdom come? And then our brows can crease a bit further when we think about some unbelievers, some very boisterous unbelievers, who will at least admit that they have a certain grudging respect for Christians who do talk about Jesus with others. They say, well, shucks, if I believed what they believed, I'd be doing that too. And they might even go so far as to say, you show me a Christian who doesn't ever talk about Jesus with anybody else, and I'll show you a pretty cold fish indeed. Well, the Lord is not cold toward all those people out there who do not believe in him. He died for them. He died for all. He died for everyone. And now... It's not just a matter of the brow furrowing, but the hand hits the forehead because it finally occurs to me, the problem is with me. The problem is with my unbelief, my lack of desire to be identified with him, who identified with me all the way to the cross. Do I really believe that the stupendous blessings that he brought about by his suffering, death, and resurrection truly are mine? That they belong to me? That I've been...
rescued from the kingdom of darkness and placed into the dominion of light where he has put me. And do, am I really convinced that he has given me the privilege of being able to extend that kingdom by telling others the good news about Jesus? At that point, my hands need to fold so I can repent and so I can receive his forgiveness and so I can pray all over again that large prayer that he taught. Thy kingdom come. God's kingdom comes here and now to me. When the, well, the Heavenly Father gives me his Holy Spirit so that by his grace I believe his holy word and lead a godly life here in time and there in eternity. Jesus himself was at pains to assure people that it is the Father's good pleasure to give me, now me, a poor, undeserving sinner who doesn't in any way merit this, to give me the kingdom. And not just me. Jesus was not just talking to any one individual when he said that. He said, have no fear, little flock. He's talking to his church. It is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. That's what the church is. That flock of sheep that hear the voice of the shepherd who loved us and gave himself for us, who laid down his life and took it up again to be our savior and our friend and our redeemer. Never underestimate the church. As many weaknesses, as many offenses, as many downright sins as it shows in this world, it is, like we sang in the first hymn, the place of God's abode. It is the realization of the kingdom. And it's also God's instrument for extending the kingdom to still other people. No Christian is in this alone. We go out into the world shoulder to shoulder with our fellow saints and, most important, we have with us the Lord who is the Alpha and the Omega, Christ himself who wins the victory. Now you know how it goes. Sunday after Sunday after preaching the gospel from the, lecture, from the pulpit here, your pastor goes over to the altar, this kind of thing will happen again this morning, and leads the people of God in prayer. And one of those requests laid before the throne of grace is what Jesus taught us to pray. Thy kingdom come. And we pray in this petition, among other things, that the kingdom may come to those who are not yet in it. So, if for some reason you are here even though you do not believe in Jesus as your Savior, I can tell you that there is absolutely no accident about that. It's not a mistake. You may feel like you were kind of dragged here by somebody else. But let me tell you the real reason why you were here. It's because this congregation has been praying. It's been praying for years. Thy kingdom come. And by the way, if you'd like to talk with me a little bit more about Jesus after church, I'd be happy to do that. And as for you who do believe in Christ as your Savior by the power of the Holy Spirit and pray that prayer, thy kingdom come, watch out. Watch all the situations, all the opportunities that the Lord is going to give you to give a reason for the hope that is in you. Now we keep on praying this prayer. And as we do, we can look around us and we can get discouraged. Because we can see how in place after place, congregation after congregation, just in our own synod, let alone anywhere else, can get smaller and smaller and smaller. That can be disappointing. And there is no reason in the world why we should not pray for this congregation, other congregations, pray for the entire synod. But let me tell you, when we pray in the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come, we're asking for something even larger, even grander, than simply to pray for our synod or any particular congregation in the synod. 
We're praying for God's whole movement, his, his kingdom, his rule and reign in grace in the hearts of people all over the world. We're praying for God to include people in that and keep them in that faith until they die and are with him in heaven. And we pray for him to hasten the day when we will be with him in heaven, when Christ will come again and take his people to be with himself, so that, as he said, where I am, there you may be also. At that point, there will be no more need to pray, thy kingdom come, just like there will be no more need to pray, forgive us our trespasses. But there will be endless and exuberant joy over the fact that the kingdom has come and that the trespasses have been forgiven, all by the blood of the Lamb who once was slain. Just think of all those saints crowded around the throne in heaven. There's all kinds of things we can say to God, all kinds of things we'll want to say to him. But according to the book of Revelation, none more powerful than blessing and honor and glory and power be to the one who sits on the throne, the king, and to the lamb forever and ever. That's the kingdom and glory. And we pray for that too when we pray, thy kingdom come. <coughs> ever since Jesus first taught the Lord's Prayer, I suppose people have had a tendency to get stuck on it. And maybe you know what this is like. People will say sometimes, well, I think the Lord's Prayer is fine. I certainly don't have any objection to anything that's there, but I just wonder, it doesn't seem to say what I mean. But you see, learning to pray really learning to pray is that you and I learn to mean what the Lord's Prayer says. And one of the things it says is, thy kingdom come. So pray that prayer. Pray for Christ to come again and take us out of this veil of tears to himself in heaven. Pray for him to come to you now with his word and spirit. Pray for him to come through you to other people who do not know him. And you can get really specific about that. Picture yourself with a pen or a pencil and a pad writing out the names of people you know who need to hear about Jesus. And then include them by name in your prayers. It's really nothing new. It's just you making completely explicit what has been implicit every time you've ever said the words, thy kingdom come. We learn to pray when the Holy Spirit leads us to mean what the Lord's Prayer says. And one of the things it says is, thy kingdom come. We can't really mean it on our own. But when he leads us, when he empowers us, we do mean it. The Holy Spirit leads us to mean it when we say, when we pray, thy kingdom come. And the peace of God which passes all understanding will set guard round about your hearts and your thoughts in Christ Jesus. We stand.
Almighty and eternal God, worthy to be held in reverence by all men and women, we give you humble and hearty thanks for the innumerable blessings which without any merit or worthiness on our part you have bestowed upon us. We praise you especially that you have preserved for us your saving word and the holy sacraments. And we ask you, O Lord, to grant and preserve to your holy church throughout the world purity of doctrine and faithful pastors to preach your word with power. Help all who hear the word rightly to understand and truly to believe it. Send laborers into your harvest and open the door of faith to those who do not know you. Thy kingdom come. In mercy, remember the enemies of your church and grant them repentance unto life. Protect and defend your church in all of its troubles and dangers. Strengthen us and all our fellow Christians to set our hope fully on the grace revealed in Christ and help us to fight the good fight of faith that in the end we may receive the salvation of our souls. Lord, in your mercy. Bestow your grace on all nations of the earth. Bless especially our country and its inhabitants and all who are in authority. We commend to you the care of all our schools and ask you to grant that our children may grow in useful knowledge and Christian virtue and bring forth wholesome fruits of life. Lord, in your mercy. Graciously defend us, we pray, from all calamity, by fire and water, war and disease, scarcity and famine. Protect and prosper everyone in their rightful callings and let all useful arts flourish among us. Be the God and Father of the widow and the orphan, the helper of the sick and needy, the comforter of the forsaken and distressed. Lord, in your mercy. Except we ask you, our bodies and souls, our hearts and minds, our talents and powers, together with the offerings we bring for your praise and service. Lord, in your mercy. Hear us this day as we bring to you the concerns on our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. And as we are strangers and pilgrims here in this world, help us by true faith and a godly life to prepare for the world to come. Doing the work you have given us to do while it is day before the night comes when no one can work. And when our last hour comes, to support us by your power and receive us into your heavenly kingdom. Into your hands we commend all for which we pray, trusting in your mercy, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, now and forever. We have a hymn. I'm not sure if you should be seated.
we continue with the service of the sacrament and we stand. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly meet, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name evermore praising you and saying, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Peace of the Lord be with you always. May the true body of our Lord Jesus Christ and his most precious blood strengthen you in true faith, granting you the forgiveness of sins unto life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. Amen. Let's just go on with the thanksgiving. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. We 
give you thanks, almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through it in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. The Lord be with you. Bless we the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.